Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and joining me is the always smiling Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. Hi, Darcy. Had the world not been gripped by a pandemic, you know what we'd be doing right now? What's that? We'd be cheering on our Aussie athletes in Tokyo. Well, we didn't see this one coming, did we, Joe? No Summer Olympics until 2021, but today we're filling the gap with an olympic theme size show. So, you know, Darcy, since the modern Summer Games began in 1896, they've only been cancelled three times, once during World War I and twice in World War II. And this time, a global pandemic, which is a different kind of war when you think about it. Yeah, sorry, it's a war that's still being waged, Joe. Here in Victoria, the state of emergency is extended until the 16th of August and masks are mandatory in Melbourne and the Mitchell Shire coronavirus hotspots. The borders are still closed in Victoria and the state's police are issuing on-the-spot fines for breaches of public health. Can you believe we would have said that at the start of the year? It is a really extraordinary time, but most of us are already doing the right thing. Just stick to the recommendations from the Chief Health Officer and stay home or stay away from large groups. Wash your hands a lot and wear a mask. It's the only way we'll get through this thing. Yeah, that's correct, Joe. Plus, the other news that Victorian AFL teams will stay in Queensland for the remainder of the season or at least another 10 weeks, which is huge as the game scrambles to continue to find a way through, Joe. They've been incredible, the AFL players and the AFL, to keep the season uh, afloat. Yes, and it's been, I tell you, so important to me and my family and so many footy fans when we're in lockdown to be able to still see the footy. So I'm grateful that they're there. And your team, the Magpies, going pretty well, Joe. I forget <laughs> so how much of a fanatic you are. <laughs> uh, and talk of the grand final. Could you, I could never imagine the our grand final anywhere apart from the MCG. It could be in Queensland, might be in Sydney, who knows? And for Olympic hopefuls all around the world, will they have an extra year to train? And we'll be getting inspired by some of them today, including the world's best canoe paddler. She's an absolute star, Jo. Yes, our world champion brothers in judo talk us through their Tokyo campaign, plus one of our sprinters will tell us how she turned sporting heartbreak into a new race to live her best life. Well, to kick us off, Victorian Lauren Burns created history by winning the first ever Olympic gold medal for Taekwondo when the sport debuted at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. Lauren joined Cathy Freeman and Susie O'Neill as one of three Aussie women to win individual gold at the home games in Sydney. I was one of the many Aussies brought to my feet when Lauren won in Sydney. Now she's using her champion combat skills to mentor other athletes and pursue her equal passion for health and nutrition. Can you take us back into that moment, uh, the, you know, Sydney Olympics, the build-up to it was magical and suddenly you win that gold medal. What, what was that like? Well, it was a pretty magic time for us. Taekwondo it was the first time we were ever involved in the Olympics as a full medal sport, so it was really a, our debut as a sport. But in terms of coming into the Games, you know, for me, my goal was always to win. That was my plan. I didn't expect anything less than that. I was just there to do a job, I was there to win, and I was completely focused on winning that gold medal. So we were right at the end of the Games, we are at the end of that two-week period. So that's a long sort of lead-in, you know. So I certainly wasn't doing any parties and all the other stuff, you know, going out and watching all the athletes at their events, which I would have loved to be doing, but I just had this incredible single-minded focus of winning. Now, Lauren, you said you weren't going to get distracted in the village by any famous people, but there is a very famous photo of you around that time with Muhammad Ali. Uh, tell us how that uh, came about. So one day we were sitting in the, in the food hall. I've got my steamed broccoli and, you know, just finished that. And all of a sudden we see a limo driver. Out hopped Muhammad Ali and wow. he walked in and the guards just said, if anyone wants a photo, come up, say hi, come and sit down, come and have a photo with him. So... I wasn't eating much, so I was straight over there. <laughs> and I sat down next to him, and then he turned around and he kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> and I came out, and my teammate, Paul Lyons, he was like, that's it, love, that's a winning kiss. You're going to win a gold medal. You got a kiss from Muhammad Ali. And he's like, oh, my God. And so I was feeling a bit special about the kiss on the cheek, but I turned around and he's just kissing all the other girls. <laughs> so it was pretty cheeky, but it was, yeah, it was actually wonderful to meet him. And, and like I said, he just had this real presence. 
Yeah, what a great uh, great story. And uh, your teammate was right. You did go on and win that famous gold medal. Uh, speaking of uh, being in the dining hall at the Olympics, you're a vegetarian from a very young age. I, I think I might have even read from as young as the age of, of three. Can you tell us the, the journey of you and being a vegetarian from such a young age? I pretty much have, yeah, been vegetarian all my life. And, you know, that was never a problem growing up. But when I was competing... A lot of dietitians told me that it just could not be done. You know, I couldn't get the protein requirements. I couldn't get the muscle repair and building muscle and having the recovery to, you know, to do the intensity that I was doing, let alone compete at such a high level. So I was actually really fortunate for me because I was studying naturopathy at the same time. So I was studying nutrition, naturopathic principles. I had a naturopath. I had the dietitian at the BIS. I had, you know, lots of different people that supported me and I was able to draw on lots of different modalities as well as my own education to implement strategies that meant that I, I was able to do that and I was able to perform and have strength and power you know decision making time and clarity and all of those things so but it was definitely definitely a exact science to be able to, to manage it. We're at the moment uh, around the time where the Olympics should be taking place in Japan could you empathize with what that would be like training for that date and to have it postponed for a year? Oh, look, I, I cannot imagine what it would be like to prepare for a Games and to have it postponed like this. You know, this is really unprecedented. Um, the thing about the Games that's hard enough anyway is it's every four years. It's such a massive thing to prepare for such a, you know, a long period of time. But, you know, I think that it's important to grieve. I think it's important for the athletes preparing for Tokyo to grieve this time and go, OK, that's, that's not happening. And, and to acknowledge those feelings, I might feel sad, angry, you know, all the things that, that might come up. But then they have to turn it, what can I take out of this to make it the most for me? And, you know, I know it's hard, there's, there's no answers, but I think that if you can find a way to go, no, this because it's going to be hard for everyone. Everyone's in the same boat going to, to the net, you know, to Tokyo. But how does this affect me? How can I, how can I change that? Welcome back. Today we're looking ahead to the postponed Tokyo Olympic Games. Before the break, we caught up with Taekwondo gold medalist Lauren Burns, Joe, who we absolutely love. Yeah. And a little while back, you learned some killer Taekwondo moves as part of a self-defence class. I remember that very well. Well, I have to say, I was totally enlightened by that class as far as what power you have in you and how much strength you have. But it was kind of fun going toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, Rach there. That was memorable, no <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> I so fell on you then. Well, the most popular martial art in the world is judo, which surprised me, I have to say. Around 13 million people do it. It's been part of the Olympics since the 1964 Tokyo Games and we've had a team compete in the event ever since. And so far, we've racked up two bronze medals in judo, but come Tokyo 2020, two Aussie brothers will be going for gold. Nathan and Josh Katz became the first siblings to represent Australia when they took to the mat at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. I think the Olympic passion was definitely ignited uh, by the fact that mum competed at the Olympic Games in Seoul in 98, uh, in 88, sorry, and dad was the coach, the Olympic coach. So we've sort of always understood how special the Olympic Games was and it's something ever since we were really little that we wanted to achieve ourselves and together. I think me being a little bit older, I would have started judo before Josh. Being the big brother naturally picking on the little brother a little bit, probably I started giving it to him a bit before he was ready to start doing judo, but if you call what we do fighting inside in the house, then if you call that judo, then I guess we started at the same time, yeah. yeah. Mum and Dad were really good with giving us the guidance, but they gave us always the option of doing what we wanted, so whether it was soccer or tennis or judo, whatever it was that we really wanted to do was what we were allowed to do. So when we were old enough to sort of start to understand what it took to get to a more competitive international level, they really had to focus in on one specific sport, what it was. And that was all self-driven between me and Nathan, obviously pushing each other to try to be the best we could be at judo. We always joke, you know, that Dad made us do judo and he'd beat us up if we wouldn't go training, but it really couldn't have been further from the case. We've always been really self-driven. We'd make Mum and Dad get us up early in the morning or take us to extra session or for extra competition, so it was really us that led that push. They were really the opposite. If anything, trying to hold us back a little bit because I think they understand the struggles of doing judo at a high level and especially when you start to lift the load. We usually train uh, six days a week and uh, of the six training days, it's two to three sessions uh, every day. So we usually have about an hour and a half 
of, uh, of hard judo, like sparring training each day. And then the morning session will be an hour of strength and conditioning, either in the gym, running, some sort of uh, aerobic conditioning. Uh, and then we have a few technical sessions as well. So on average, it's about 15 uh, sessions per week. I guess I'm in a pretty good position to comment on some of the physical struggles uh, of judo. Injuries are just a really uh, common part of the sport that it's really difficult to escape from. I was competing at Olympic qualifying in Perth and uh, just my arm got caught in a fight. It was extreme bad luck, I guess you could call it, and just tore the ligament and the tendon off okay. the bone. The skull's looking really good. I guess I didn't get to see all the, the nice work that the surgeon got to do, but uh, he left a nice little scar to remind me of uh, the good work he did. And that's more through. Just right over the side. At the moment, I'm just working with the physio uh, three or four times a week just to try to get the full range of motion back again. And then uh, as soon as this brace comes out, I'll be back to, back to work for real. Did you see? Uh, I try not to show my injuries off quite as much as Josh, who walks around with a brace, but <laughs> I have had a lot of struggles as well, especially before Rio and since. It's just an aspect of the sport that you have to manage and luck to try and hope that you can get through a, a cycle without too many serious injuries. There's a huge amount of mental training that has to go into the physical training as well. Just understanding the times where you really need to push yourself to that level of exhaustion or to extra fatigue that start to build up that level of tolerance. It's hard to perform when you get one crack at something and there's 15,000 people in a stadium and the rest of the world watching on live TV. So um, it's something that you have to prepare for and a lot of people aren't, aren't able and aren't capable of, of delivering under the bright light. So it's a massive, it's a massive part of the sport for sure. It'd be nice if you control through your trunk good. The diet and the nutrition and the weight making side of things are definitely the biggest difficulty and probably the least enjoyable part of the process that we're going through at the moment. Josh fights under 60 kilos, I fight under 66, and we both sit probably between five and six kilos above that weight division. And if you don't make the weight, you don't fight. So it's the first part of the fight, really. You don't get to the fight if you don't get win the fight against the scales. The way in which we both qualified for it is actually pretty funny. Probably a 10 minutes max between the time that Josh won his final Olympic qualifying event and I won my, my final in the same event. So. For Josh to achieve something like that at such a young age, only 18, and for me to do so at 21 as well, to get to share that together with mum and dad there watching, it was, it was super special. It was one of our best days in judo for sure. Toughest competitor. I think little brother always has that thing because they've little been- A little bit of a chip on little your bit, shoulder. A little bit smaller, a little bit younger, been beaten up for a few years, so, um, I don't know if I want to say this on record, but <laughs> I think Josh is probably a few steps ahead I was than I was when I was 21, so we'll, uh, we'll see. It's always intrigued me that some families can have two or three champions. I mean, I guess the odds were with those guys, given their parents were champions too, but certainly we got no champions in my family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the fact that they chose the sport, though. They asked their parents to wake them up early to train and not the other way around. So I love that self-driven motivation and passion. Such passion to conquer something can only be admired, no matter how big or small your challenge. And I've seen it with people trying to give up smoking. Now, it might sound like an easy thing to do for a non-smoker, but it's just not. Nicotine is such an addictive drug. Anyone who gives it up really is a champion, I think. So hang in there. It might take a few goes, but you'll get there. I wish I could do that. You're watching the House of Wellness. Around 1,600 Australians are currently waiting for a life-changing organ or tissue transplant. And while the majority of us believe it's important to be a donor, only one in three are actually registered, Joe, You have to tick that box on your driver's licence. Have you actually done it? I think I did the last time I renewed my licence, but I, it had taken me a long time to do that, largely just out of apathy. Well, I remember the last time that I read about it, I actually picked up the phone and did mm. it, and it's as simple as once you tick your driver's licence, you donate your organs to, uh, to someone if indeed that becomes the case. Yeah, so whatever your choice, it's important to have the chat with your family and friends. 44% of families don't know how their family members feel about it, so this could be your opportunity. It's Donate Life Week, which is all about encouraging more of us to register to be a donor. Now, most people wouldn't be aware that there's an event called the Transplant Games held here in Australia and around the world every couple of years. They are truly inspirational events and you won't be in any doubt about that after you see what a second chance at life can do. 
So I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at 18 months old. So my whole life I really only knew having cystic fibrosis. I was a pretty sick little kid in terms of needing um, physiotherapy every day, um, but my parents really wanted to push me to do um, normal things. And so I was still, you know, I still went to school normally. And then they had this great idea that because my lungs were affected that I could, if I started swimming, it would help. So they got me swimming actually when I was about three, I learned how to swim. And then I started racing at about five and that sort of became a huge part of my life and it kept me well. Swimming was Anna Maudlin's lifeline. It was what got her through her childhood. But when she hit her twenties, her lungs began to fail. There was only one option. I was um, put on the transplant list um, when I was 29 years old. You don't get a transplant unless you're at the end of your life. Anna waited 119 days. And then she got her second chance. So my life changed. It did change immediately after. As soon as I got the transplant, the oxygen came off. I no longer had to do physiotherapy treatments because the cystic fibrosis is still in my body, but the lungs is the part that was um, taking my life. And so they took that part out, put new lungs in. So it, it's amazing the change that happens. She's doing well. She's catching up to the guy who's second. She's done a great job. With the physical and mental freedom that came with her new set of lungs, Anna hit the pool with a vengeance. She cleaned up at the local level and set her sights on a bigger prize, the transplant games. In the first games, I just did swimming. Um, and then when I was successful in those five events that I competed in, I decided I was gonna go to the World Transplant Games. I think I got two golds, a silver, and then we got bronze in the USA relays. But the taste of success was infectious. And along with her new lease of life, nothing was going to stop Anna now. The transplant games became her world stage. I expanded from swimming. I added golf, ballroom dancing, petanque, bocce, volleyball. Um, it sort of became my thing every year to just add a new sport, try something. Like there was no reason not to try. I was given this gift. I have this physical ability now. Why not try things? At the games, Terry Hollyoke was also trying lots of things he never dreamed he'd do after losing his sight to keratitis. I had some vision problems from about the age of eight or nine. Then at about the age of 12, there was a dramatic change. And then at the age of about 19 or 20, um, they said I was going legally blind. And then um, I was recommended to get be put onto the transplant list to get a corneal transplant, which I got on my 21st birthday. I remember getting the call that day and for me the overwhelming thing was the fact that I knew where this cornea was coming from. I knew someone had passed away for me to be able to get the gift that I was getting. For me there was an overwhelming feeling of guilt and, I, and actually there's a little bit of mourning for the person who was going to be giving me this cornea. Terry picked up his fair share of medals at several World Games events but in Cleveland in 2016 he won much more than gold. I would never have thought I was going to find the love of my life at a transplant community. There is no way that I would have thought that, let alone in America, like travelling to America and it happening. I would never have thought that that was going to happen. But fortunately for me, it did. Organ donation has um, not only changed my life and given me life um, and enhanced my husband's life, but it has also, it's the thing that's brought us together. So I would have never known that I would have gotten the gift of life, but then also I've got a husband on the side too. Likewise, I think, I think um, yeah, it's enhanced our lives in many more ways than the transplant themselves. So yeah, pretty lucky. I love that story. In 2018, Terry and Anna won gold in the mixed relay swimming team and they even competed in the ballroom dancing event as well. I just love a good romance, <laughs> don't you, Dust? Well, I do too, Joe. <laughs> Maybe not quite as much as you, but uh, you might be surprised to know that Australia is a world leader for successful transplants. Our donation rate has more than doubled in recent years, but there's much more that we can do.
You can register via the Donate Life or MyGov websites. It's easy. It can make such a difference to so many lives. You're right, Joe. And while there'll be no Aussie transplant games this year, like the Olympics, they're firing up for 2021. So lots of sport coming our way next year. Make dad, mum and dad proud. Veggies, plenty of veggies. Crock and bush. <laughs> Hot chips. <laughs> Running. Most treasured possession is my bed. Okay, not bad. Most scared of? Hamstrings. Tokyo. Welcome back. The 2020 Summer Olympics should be lighting up Tokyo right now, but of course they've been postponed. Our strength has generally been in the pool, Joe, with three of Australia's top four Olympic medal winners, Ian Thorpe, Dawn Fraser and the legendary Murray Rose, all being champion swimmers. Our medal hall isn't just restricted to the pool, though. Australia has also produced the world's best kayak and canoe paddler, Jessica Fox. Jess took Olympic silver in London and bronze in Rio and she's taken out seven world championship gold medals, making her the most successful paddler in history. Yeah, we caught up with the Aussie Queen of the Whitewater to see how she's shaping up for Tokyo 2021. When we moved to Australia, you know, this was my playground. I used to jump on the rafts, I used to throw rocks in the water, but they never really pushed us into it. It was kind of, okay, let's try all different sports. So I was more into swimming and gymnastics, but when I broke my arm doing gymnastics, my physio suggested that I start paddling again for rehab and I was about 11 or 12 and at that age I started making friends um, in the sport and I was old enough to go on the rapids and once I hit those rapids it was kind of the game changer for me, I was definitely hooked. I've always dreamt about the Olympic Games and I always was obsessed by them as a kid, you know, 2000, 2004, 2008, watching them on TV. And so from a young age, I knew that if I wanted to achieve a goal, I had to kind of work hard. But I'm lucky that in my sport, there's so much variety in training. Every course is different. So it's never a really mundane activity and, and boring and repetitive. It's quite exciting because you're always challenging yourself. 2012 was such an incredible experience to make. My first Olympics at the age of 18, I'd just finished school and I was probably more aiming for Rio, thinking that was more realistic. But in 2010, 2011, I started to see that I was doing really well at a senior level as well. So my goal then became maybe I can qualify for the London Olympics. And because I'd qualified, I think I was qualified in eighth position for the final, I was one of the first girls to, to go. So there were still seven girls left behind me so I just had to wait and see where I'd end up and when I got to around the fifth position I was like oh that's amazing at worst I'm fifth and then it was oh at worst I'm fourth oh please let me have a medal <laughs> and then coming home with the silver medal was just amazing. Rio was really different to London I think I'd had a different lead in as well more mature athlete. I'd had the success of London, but then some world championships in between. So I arrived in Rio with different expectations and, and higher standards and um, yeah, the desire to just get out there and attack it and win. Essentially, I wanted to get on that podium again and to come third and win a second Olympic medal was, was really nice. And it was actually 20 years after my mum had won her um, bronze medal at Atlanta. So to share that moment with her, who's al she's also my coach, was really special. Mum is a tough coach, yeah, she, but she's also a really kind and caring coach. Um, I think she makes it fun, she makes it enjoyable, but she also pushes us hard and expects excellence. So we've got to bring our best every day and she knows me best, you know, she's, she wears the mum hat, she wears the coach hat and she knows what I need to, to give my best as well. The build up to Tokyo has been quite long, I think. 
It was frustrating and disappointing to know that the goalposts had shifted another 12 months when you were so close and I was feeling so ready and so fit. Um, but, you know, it gives us an extra 12 months to, to be better, to, to, um, to keep improving. We definitely had to be pretty creative and innovative during isolation to try and keep the feeling and keep fit and healthy and, and also progress a little bit. So I set myself little challenges and, you know, I tried to learn how to juggle. I used the Swiss ball a lot because when we're on the Whitewater Rapids, it's all about that instability and, and you've got to really have a strong core. So using the Swiss ball, using elastics to try and replicate that water pressure. Um, I got in my kayak to add that 10 kilo weight and tried to do those. So. Yeah, I mean, it was all about having fun as well in that time. We weren't sure how long it was going to go for, so just staying fit and healthy and keeping it fun as well. I put the kayak in the pool as well to try and, um, yeah, work on some little drills. I couldn't do a whole lot in seven metres, but it was still really nice to have the pool and use it for something different. To be mentally in the zone and in that flow state in competition, I think it definitely needs to be trained in practice. Um, I think we do a lot of mental work even if we don't realise it's a mental session. Sometimes that's just doing 10 runs down the course and then mum will say, okay, this 10th run has to be your fastest. And on paper you would think, well, it's your 10th run, you're probably really fatigued, but that's when you've got to really switch on that focus. You've got to really up your game in terms of your concentration during the course and getting into that flow state and pushing yourself. So I sort of practice it every day in training so that when I get onto the competition day, I know that I've done the work, I'm confident in that sense. And on the start line, I just focus on my breathing, I focus on a few key things that I need to do in the run, but then I've just got to let it be automatic. I've got to let my body do the work and, and my mind stays clear. Until now, I didn't even know the difference between the canoe and kayak <laughs> events task. Now I do. In a canoe, athletes kneel and use a single-bladed paddle, whereas you sit down in a kayak and use a double blade, which I think are more suited to sitting down in a kayak. Sounds more, more, more your style, is it? I think, well, yeah. I think that means if Luke Hines and Gerald Quigley were a paddle event, they'd be a kayak because they're double trouble in the mm. kitchen. Do you see what I did there? I saw it. Double yeah. trouble. <laughs> and here they are right now with a kids' party favourite that'll help fight off the symptoms of cold and flu. GQ, I know you're a chocoholic, I'm definitely a chocoholic, and Aussies are chocoholics. But did you know that Victoria is actually the chocolate capital of Australia? Perhaps, Heinzi, that's got something to do with where we are now. But I think the whole country could get on board today with your magnificent chocolate crackles, which you assure me are healthy. They are, GQ. I'm using raw cacao powder, which is chocolate in its natural state, which is packed with minerals and antioxidants. Plus, I'm actually adding almonds today, which are packed with a wide range of nutrients themselves. Heinzi, while they're both delicious, both the cacao and the almonds are rich in zinc, and zinc is an important mineral for immune function. It helps us cope with the severity of the symptoms and it hastens recovery from common colds and flu. Oh, GQ, you're talking my language. I'm a germaphobe from way back. Just the thought of it, a sore throat, a cough, a runny nose, headaches, night sweats, fever. Not my cup of tea. A recipe for disaster. Well, in your kitchen, Heinzi, it's all about recipes for deliciousness, not disasters. But in addition to zinc, we can turn to the herbal world to help us improve our immune system and our immune function, particularly Echinacea and Andrographis. OK, Echinacea, definitely heard of that, but Andrawattis? Andrographis, Heinzi, is a herb native to South Asian countries like Sri Lanka and India, known for its immune-boosting properties, particularly the stems and the leaves. So how can me and my fellow germaphobes get more of this powerful plant into our lives? Well, unlike, Heinzi, the zinc that you've got in your beautiful crackles. Echinacea and andrographis are best taken in supplement form. Well, GQ, I think we should crack on and get eating my chocolate crackles. Thank you, Heinzi. Perfect food for a chocoholic like me. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Ethical Nutrients Immune Defence, helping you fight the seven symptoms of cold and flu. This is the House of Wellness. Joe, one of the many charities I know you're passionate about is called Polish Man, which helps end violence against children 
You're an ambassador last year in a campaign that raised more than $1 million and you painted my nail yes. and I have never had so many people approach me about it. It's fantastic because it starts a great conversation. And that's the whole point. We paint one nail out of five because one child every five minutes dies due to violence around Just the world. horrific when you actually say that out loud. But you were very kind in letting me paint that nail. Well, thank you, because I felt informed and started that very important conversation, which was, uh, which was great. Happy to support but if you want to go the whole hog and do all 10 nails, Jade and Sarah are here with a rainbow of choices. I'm obsessed with nails, but it's been a bit tricky the last few months and I have found the best DIY solution. OK, Sarah, we're going to give your nails an at-home Manny makeover. <laughs> well, they need it, so I'm excited. <laughs> The OPI Nail Lacquer is a fast drying formula that lasts up to seven days of wear and shine. There's a shade to match every mood and every outfit. I think I'm feeling this bright red colour. It's big apple red and it's already, I feel like it'll transport me to New York. Yeah, we're there, we're in New York right now. <laughs> I'm feeling Manhattan coming on. It's a triple step process. Base coat, then colour, then top coat. The word salon quality really gets thrown around a lot in the beauty industry. However, a brand like OPI, for me as an expert in this industry, is very trusted and of an amazing standard. Give the bottle a good shake. That way it mixes the pigment properly. Apply two thin layers of colour to each nail. You feel very feminine with a red nail. Yeah. So lastly, we're going to apply the OPI top coat, just one thin layer. It'll lock in that amazing red colour and have long-lasting shine. Look at this. Look how that shine's coming up. How strong is that colour? What I love about OPI Nail Lacquer is it's salon quality, but in the comfort of your own home. Can you believe how simple that was? I'm pretty sure I nailed it. Well, today we're celebrating all things sport and the amazing resilience of our athletes who have been forced to put their dreams of competing on hold for now. One sports star who knows all too well what that's like is champion Aussie beach sprinter Katie Williams. Joe. Katie was on track to take out gold at the 2016 Lifesaving World Championships until a serious chest infection forced her to bow out. She overcame her crushing disappointment and long road to recovery through meditation, yoga and a holistic approach to health. Now, Katie's new mission is to help everyone live their best life. Hey, I'm Katie Williams and I was one of Australia's leading beach sprinters. I'm going to take you through a day in the life if you can keep up. So I started beach sprinting for Surf Life Saving when I was age four. It's much harder to run on the sand and it's a slightly different technique. So the distance is 90 metres on the sand um, or there's the beach flag which is 20 metres on the sand. To give you some context, if you're running on the beach and you're doing 90 metres, that's the equivalent of 120 metres on the track. When I turned 19, I finally achieved my dream. And that was, I made the Australian team and I also um, won world titles. So I was the, the fastest female in the world, which was amazing. And I only retired four years ago. So I did it for most of my life. I trained so much and I tried to be so fit that I actually became quite unhealthy. I put a lot of pressure on myself and I just wanted to win. So now I just have a more holistic view of health. So I normally wake up at 5.30 and then I will meditate for 20 minutes. So my rule is meditate before I caffeinate. I start by planning my day from start to finish. I work in the city, so I go to hustle boxing and, and teach um, boxing classes. We're looking for strong movement. It's functional movement. We're looking for quality here instead of quantity. It's just so empowering with music and lights and 50 people in the classroom and everyone's yelling and having a good time. So I love it. Collectively, we're exercising and bettering ourselves. And for me, it's a massive part of my training regime. I also have a podcast called Better For It, so I go into the studio some days. Most days I'm in front of the camera because I vlog the challenges I'm doing for the podcast. So I take on health and wellness and lifestyle challenges like quitting sugar, quitting coffee, intuitive eating, going plant-based, um, high protein. I bring in an expert and I interview them and then they set me a challenge. I think that I've abused the relationship with coffee and I do think what that I'm measuring is my mental, social and physical health. And the whole point of the, the podcast and the episode is if I will think, move or feel better from doing the challenge. 
I'm bettering myself, um, changing my habits, and people are doing it with me. And it's just such a, it's such a beautiful thing. I'm trying to learn to do less. For me, the biggest thing now is self-care and looking after my health. So having rest days, I couple that with a beauty regime. As I've gotten older, I've worn less makeup and I've opted for more natural products. It's not just about what you eat, it's also about what you put on your skin. I've been working with Angela since last year. My favourite product is the Glycolytic Mask. You can definitely feel the tingle on the skin. Once it's on the skin, you can feel this like tingling and it probably lasts about 10 minutes. I leave it on for 10 to 15 minutes, then you can feel it taking away the dead skin. I usually apply the mask once or twice a week and it smells beautiful. It's like a cinnamon pumpkin puree almost. The ingredients in the mask are really natural. So you've got glycolic acid, manuka honey, you've got pumpkin, and you've also got vitamin C. Oh, and fruit stems. When I take the mask off, my skin feels soft. It helps with skin texture, leaves you feeling glowy and luminous, and your skin feels really bright. Trust me, they keep going, <laughs> and so do I. My life is full on, and energetically, it can be hard to, to keep up. Even though I have this athletic, very disciplined, very tough exterior, um, there's a huge part of me that's uh, very emotional and very human and exercise is massive for me. If I'm not training, I actually don't feel myself. For me, I now train because I love it. I train to feel good. I still feel em empowered and strong in training, but I don't feel the pressure. I train to stay fit. I, I don't really train so much for this crazy goal um, because, yeah, my goal was to be world champion. And it felt amazing when I got there, but you know, five years of hard work, it's, it's a full-on commitment. I don't do that now. <laughs> I like rosé too much. <laughs>back one of the greatest moments from the 2016 Rio Olympics was when the Aussie women took gold in the rugby sevens and seeing our girls beat the Kiwis 24 to 17 and score our fourth gold medal of the games was a highlight Joe. Oh it really was Darce and a standout performer in the match was young gun Ivania Politi who scored one of Australia's four tries. Now the sporting superstar wants to win back-to-back -back gold in Japan and inspire a new generation of girls to take up the sport. My family grew up mad rugby supporters. I didn't really have any interest in rugby at all. Rugby league more so growing up, but not rugby union. So my family pretty much, I remember the day so clearly, forced me into the car and drove me to a try rugby sevens day. And I refused to get out of the car. And my mum was like, we're not leaving until you get out and try it. I loved it more than I wanted to admit to my family that day. I loved it, like I've always loved the contact side of sport. I grew up playing touch football, but there was just something about playing a more contact sport that I really, really loved. From then it kind of really escalated a lot quickly than I expected it to. We entered a school competition. We went along, we made the grand final. We've unfortunately lost, but we had a lot of fun. And then from there, a couple of us from my school made the selections to try it for Queensland, did the trials and I was fortunate enough to make the state side. We made it all the way to the final against New South Wales and then we were fortunate enough to head out to Suncorp Stadium and play our grand final match in between the World Seven Series. The head coach at the time for the Australian Seven side, he was there and he'd scouted a few of us girls to come along and join the National Seven side as a training squad. And then from there, yeah, a couple of months later, I was fortunate enough to train with the girls and then get my debut in the Netherlands. There's the big physical side, but there is a lot of side of it that is mental as well. You know, the mental toughness, I really had to work hard on that in my first couple of seasons with the team. You know, the training was so hard, the conditioning was hard, the hardest thing I've ever done so far. I remember coming home sometimes crying, wondering why I'm still even doing this and putting my body through this. but. You know, when you get to go out and run out for your country and put on that jersey and celebrate wins and sometimes losses with teams, you know, you've got to learn from those losses, but celebrate the big moments with the girls, you know, that just kind of makes everything that you put your body through worth it. 2015, 2016 was definitely the best year Australian women's rugby had. That was the first year that we'd won the World Series. So coming out of that, obviously, people had named us as being the favourites to win the Olympics. So there was a lot of hype around us during that time. And obviously, 
this was the first time women's sevens was in the Olympics, so that added a lot of extra pre pressure to us, but we came off a couple of good wins that year, a couple of series wins, and then obviously we went to the Olympics and we had another great win there. I just remember wanting to turn around and just hug everybody. I remember just the smiles and everyone, and you know, there are even a few tears, but you know, tears of absolute joy. Ready, around, ready, turn, 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 this way, come on. Obviously the gold medal really helped put rugby on the map and you've now seen the number of participation for women in Australia and young girls, you know, wanting to come forward and play a contact sport like sevens has been a lot better. And even now, like a lot of us girls get approached by younger girls to be able to learn rugby. They want to learn how to get into it, constantly asking us about pathways and how they can get themselves into playing rugby as well. Obviously, finding out the postponement of the Olympics was really quite deflating and heartbreaking. You know, we've been working our butts off for the last four years and a lot of girls had had plans for what they were going to do post-2020. It, it is a bit hard that I have to do it for another 12 months, but it is comforting knowing that we can taper for a little bit before getting back into it. Things can settle down a little bit before we can ramp it back up again next year. You've always got to put in 110% and I always found the best quote someone gave me was, be the player that you'd love to play next to. And I think that's something that I've always carried with myself. You know, you're not just playing for yourself. You're not just playing for your country, your family. You are playing for the girls right next to you that you bust your backside for every single day at training. No wonder so many young girls want to emulate Ivania and her teammates. The Sevens has achieved equal pay with the blokes and was one of the first to become full-time professional athletes in Australia. They're just amazing. And it's a brilliant Olympic sport. Yeah. It works really well and they certainly did as proud in Rio. Well, that's our show for today. You can find more great information on our website, houseofwellness.com.au and by tuning in to the House of Wellness radio show with Joe and GQ every Sunday... You'll also hear the best of you with Joe and Emma Murray on the podcast of the same name. How's that going, Joe? It's going really well. It is called Best of You in the House of Wellness. And two of the episodes actually feature Olympic athletes. We've got Morgan Mitchell, who is a superstar runner for us, and Caroline Buchanan, who's represented Australia at the Olympics in BMX. So make sure you check it out, podcast1australia.com.au to download. I look download. forward to doing that, Joe. Thanks, as always, to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. Stay well, stay safe. And we'll see you next time.